screen and all. But right. why don't we start with a, a brief introduction for those who um, don't know you? Could you give us a bit of background? Yeah, absolutely. Some, and thanks so much for having me, Frankie. My name's Leo Rodman, and um, like many people here, I'm active in the AI space, particularly on LinkedIn. Um, I would say my areas of greatest expertise are probably ChatGPT and MidJourney. Um, I've been posting about those for a while. Um, and I've been working in education and technology and ed tech for about the past 20 years. Um, so I definitely have some experience going back um, also with graphic design. And all these things, I think, really come in handy when working with modern AIs. Um, so it's just a great pleasure to be here. And I'm really excited to talk about some of what's been going on with animation and AI. Awesome. Great. Yeah, so I think, you know, the first thing to talk about in animation is probably what we've all seen with early animation um, coming out of runway. So I think probably the biggest things we all saw were Barbenheimer, um, which kind of went crazy and viral across the internet, um, kind of riding that Barbie wave. We also saw Genesis, though, right, a fake sci-fi movie um, trailer. But I think, you know, the big limitation right now is just you can't really get much more than trailers out of current AI because of time limitation. So at the time that Barbenheimer and Genesis came out, Runway was only able to do a four second clip. Um, now you're able to extend that up to 18 seconds, um, but sometimes things go a little bit haywire as you go on with your generations. And that's really why they limited it to four seconds to begin with, um, because as you continue to generate, the AI starts to hallucinate and do weird things. Um, I would say this is because those um, particular AI models for video were trained on a variety of kinds of video. Thanks. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, so they were trained on a variety of different types of um, videos, some including sci-fi and wild and creative things, some including more realistic portrayals. And so, you know, you really have to train a model to be specific to what you're trying to get. Um, it's really hard to make a generalist model that's going to work for everything. So when you run things through Runway, um, there's one artist I really like on Instagram called Nice Aunties, um, like, you know, my mother's sister aunties um, and they do a lot of generations where they create things with the weird parameter in mid journey and then run it into runway and just kind of all kinds of wacky stuff happens where people are like merging in and out of each other and turning into butterflies which is cool but i think that's highly limiting if you wanted to actually produce a two-hour movie or one-hour movie which i think is what people are really excited about um and really want to be doing um certainly if i could be directing a movie from home and typing out prompts. Um, obviously it takes a while to get something like that really good. Um, but I think what's exciting about that possibility is that it opens the door for creatives who don't have a lot of resources. So right now, if you wanna make a movie, you have to be like a Hollywood studio or at least come up with like 50 or hundred grand and some people to work for free. Um, <laughs> in a couple of years with AI, I think some kid um in a developing country who's working on their cell phone and doesn't even have a landline internet connection or school or formal education um is going to be able to read stuff on the internet teach themselves they're still gonna have to do some work with you know learning about how to do all this but i think a lot of that can be done for free on the internet and that really democratizes creation in a way that's very exciting much in the way that the internet has done that uh, to some extent um I think that a couple of newer things that are exciting are Creative Corridor. Um, and I'll show a quick clip from that. I can figure out how to share screen. But basically what they're doing is they're doing mocap or motion capture, but they're doing it without a motion capture rig. They're just videoing people with iPhones and then running that through an AI model to turn them into consistent characters throughout a series. Um, which is I'd one love of to the see that. Challenges. Yeah. I've, I've done a bit of motion capture in the past. I'm not sure if this will give us audio or not. 
Wouldn't it be cool if you could film yourself and easily? Oh, we can't see it. Oh yeah, here we go. You see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Create a means of capturing performance, and you can visualize whatever your imagination wants afterwards. This kind of no limits creativity is only accessible to films or animations of multi-million dollar budgets, but it's part of our humanity to try to visualize things that don't exist. Like let's talk about traditional. Right. So what these people did, and you could see in the beginning of that, um, <clears throat> is that they basically created a like a mocap like video, but they did it on their phone um, and then ran that through an AI to turn it into an anime. Um, and the idea is that you could have anyone playing as the actors and then just swap in visuals using an AI, whether it's an anime or a video. Um, I think another creation that's really exciting um, that some people may have seen, I guess sharing video didn't work great, so I'll describe it more, but um, an AI generated fake TV episode of South Park, um, where the idea is that Essentially, an AI can do all the work of creating a TV episode. You just have to fill in some of the basics. And I think, you know, people get scared about that kind of thing. And that's something worth talking about is, you know, in the future, what's the role for real creatives, right? Is an AI going to replace everyone? I think a lot of people are afraid of that, um, especially in Hollywood, whether it's directors, other creatives, actors. Um, and I think, you know, really what I'm seeing and a lot of other people are seeing is that the top creation coming um, out right now is generally, you know, by people who have experience with graphic design, who have experience with videography, who have experience with writing. And, you know, ultimately, I think AI is just an enhancement tool. Like, yeah, can anyone sit down and type in cool picture of dog and get a cool picture of a dog? Yeah, but that's not really that creative and it's only exciting and amazing right now because it's new, but that's, you know, going to become commonplace. And I think what's really exciting is seeing what someone with 20, 40, 50 years of creative experience gets when they're plugged into an AI. Um, and, you know, again, giving access to each of those creators, you know, basically anyone who has 50 years of experience in videography probably has a couple of ideas for a movie they've always wanted to make, right? Um, but they've never had that opportunity until two years from now. I think we're, again, not quite there. But, you know, in the next couple of years, I think it's going to be possible for, um, again, a videographer, a photographer, a writer to come up with a whole movie themselves. And I think, you know, what AI is really doing is it's filling in the cast of characters so that, you know, all the other things that that writer needs are available to them. So that writer can't make a movie by themselves, right? And they don't have the money to hire a bunch of people. But if they can do a really good job on all the writing and then let an AI do the rest, you know, this human still has creative input. Um, but I just think we're going to see a lot more output. So everyone's going to be creating all kinds of cool stuff. We're going to be discovering creators in a way we haven't before. Um, and I think that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question, Frankie? Yeah, no, I, I, was, I was thinking it's, going to democratize things as well so you might get a um, filmmaker who's only 14 years old or you might get someone from I don't know the Philippines or something like that um, so it will give opportunities to less economically developed countries just like what you were saying before well I think you know one fear and one thing to watch out for is that some of these AI tools do cost money and, you know, for me, $10 a month isn't a big deal, but for some people it is. Um, so I'm really hopeful that a lot of these top companies, once they get really big, um, have some grant programs or scholarship programs to offer some of these top tier tools to people in these developing countries who could be top creators potentially. Um, because I, that's yeah. one thing I worry about, right? Like if I'm using ChatGPT5 and everyone in the Philippines is using free ChatGPT 3.5, that's almost the same competitive advantage as AI versus not AI. Like there's a huge difference between presumably what's gonna come out in the next version of GPT and what was available in the last free version. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think that's a worry. Um, same thing with the cost of all these rigs to run AIs, like to run an AI, you've gotta have a lot of compute resources. Frequently, if you wanna do it at scale and in a cost-effective manner, you need to have 
like millions of dollars of GPUs sitting around, which are hard to acquire, even if you have the money. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I do worry about potentials for divides. Um, and I'm just hopeful that people will be cognizant of that and have, you know, continue to have grant programs and scholarship programs and donation programs to make sure that uh, everyone's a part of this AI future together. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah, so I think, you know, I touched on directors before, and one other group that's kind of scared is actors. Um, we'll also talk about writers a little bit. Um, so, you know, actors are scared. I think a lot of this mocap transformation um, and also just recording mocap type videos to train AIs are going to offer opportunities for actors. Um, I think a lot of actors also might be interested in trying their chops at directing. Um, will some people lose jobs? Probably in every industry. Yeah, it's going to be a time of change. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily people who are unskilled at their job who lose their jobs. It's more going to be people who aren't good at adapting to AI related change who are going to end up facing the chopping block. So, you know, even if you're not great at your fields, I think what you can do to protect your job is to get really good at using AI within your field. Um, because that pretty much no matter what you do, that's going to be the future. Um, I think same thing for writers. Ultimately, I think AI is going to be a helpful writing tool. Um, I haven't yet seen a novel by an AI that I like. Um, but I'm open to the idea, you know, if it can write a good book, I'm certainly open to the idea. Um, I certainly use AIs more as an ideation engine and less of a full creative engine. Like I put my own thoughts in and I just say, fix my grammar, right? Um, but I think it could be helpful for outlining or for coming up with ideas like what's going to happen in chapter 17. I've got a writer's block. Um, so you might try something like Google Text FX is kind of cool. Personally, I mostly just use GPT. Um, but yeah, what do you think about compensating actors? Do, they, do you think they deserve to be uh, paid or remunerated for uh, appearing in a movie? Yeah, absolutely. Like their the name, image, likeness. I, I think that will be important. The thing is... Like even our images are all over the internet. Like Facebook has, it recognizes us. It could recognize us a long, long, long time ago. Um, and because of data sharing before GDPR and things, that means other companies can identify who we are. Um, I don't even have GDPR to protect me. How yeah, I exactly. So that it's it's not just celebrities and actors and sports personalities. We're all entitled to protect our name, image, and likeness. One one area that I am fearful of is um, I had people going to modeling agencies to do photogrammetry of of um, models' faces, um, and. In theory, that's great if they are being remunerated, but they also need to know whether their face is being used because you can imagine, um, you know, it's high fashion, but then at the bottom end of the scale, you've got bikinis and porn and things like that. So, um, and that's exploitative for, for these girls. So I think, and then imagine suddenly they come across that one day and they get acute and you can't tell if that's real or if it's fake. Um, I think it, there, there are all sorts of thorny issues. So once your image is released out into the ether, how do you protect it? Because it's just, um, there's so much content that's out there and it's yeah. hard to you know, pull it all back into, the, you know, pull everything back into the, once a genie is out of the bottle, how do you put it back in? That's the kind of issue that we're dealing with. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly in this day and age hard to tell already whether an image is real or not. Um, you know, this background behind me, fake. Um, but, you know, if you look at, for example, the highlighting on the, the chair over here, right, with the light from the fire, that's something as a photographer I would look at for mm -hmm. reality. Or if you look over here at this... Um, uh, stick, I guess, next to the candle and the table, it's shadow cast on the chair. These things are getting really good. Um, it's getting really hard to tell the difference between reality and fake. And 
everyone's talking about like watermarks and things like that. But, um, you know, someone who's worked in computers and graphics for years, you can defeat a watermark in like 0.0, .0 seconds. It's like the silliest thing, whether it's digital or embedded in the image, you can just blur those out without really changing the image, but effectively destroying the watermark instantly. Mm. So really those watermarks are just relying on good faith. And if you're already relying on good faith, you know, the person already is probably going to disclose this as by AI. Um, like I put some kind of AI related tag, usually multiples and anything that I put that includes AI. Um, you know, again, I think it's going to be an education thing. Like children just need to be taught at school every grade level, probably like it needs to be like an all year, every year class. You know, how do you recognize reality from fiction? How can you tell if something is a real person or generated by AI? Um, and I think it's more context and logic that help you out than actually looking at the image, um, especially moving forward, where in a couple of years, it's going to be literally impossible with any method to tell the difference between an actual photograph and something generated by AI. There's more a question of saying like, oh. So that's where it's... Um... It's that concept of, of the matrix. Like we might not be in a computer program, but we might get to a point in time where we just we generally can't tell the difference between what's real and fake. If if at the moment, you know, we're experiencing technology through our computers and our mobile phones, but if it's literally everywhere, that's where it becomes confusing. Yeah, and, you know, we may see personalized advertisements that do creepy things like show our real life friends enjoying a whatever beer in the hopes that that'll not creep us out, but convince us and, you know, drink that beer and maybe people will accept weird things like that in the future. Um, mm. you know, there are already billboards that can use cameras to see, like, who's looking at what and to pro um, profile that person, usually. Mm -hmm. Or you have your ex-girlfriend who just keeps lurking up in all of these ads everywhere. Well, you always see like, that. God damn it. Like, yeah, <laughs> Boy, things with the pop -ups, and it's just... like, get the pop-ups away, right? <laughs> um, but I kind of see real life maybe headed a little bit that way. Um, I know Xander Sims spoke earlier, and I'm sure he has more thoughts about that than I do about the metaverse and what that's going to look like. But mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be unusual in five years to see someone walking down the street with some kind of apple vision headset and like talking on a call while they're walking down the street yeah like already walking people are quite zoned out you know they but they're taking selfies all the time you go to a restaurant barely anyone's talking anymore they're all on their phones so um yeah we're the only ones talking on zoom <laughs> Well, you know, I definitely think there's something to be said for face-to-face -face contacts. Um, my day job, I work at an IT company that unusually for IT companies is 100% in person. Um, we do long-term deals and handshake deals and a lot of in-person visits and everyone thinks we're crazy, but, um, you know, some things are best done in person. And I think also it's kind of like a tip of the hat almost to how things used to be um where yeah in-person meetings are slowly going away but it's kind of nice to meet people face to face when it's geographically convenient right like I actually like going to a real in-person meeting um instead of a zoom when it's a possibility um so you know I think those things still have value I think that real interactions and content like guaranteed created by a real human is going to have a premium price tag in the future so, you know, you'll go to an art market and there'll be like a million prints from Mid Journey and then there'll be like the high premium stuff where it was like painted by a classically trained artist with an actual brush and people will hang that stuff up in their apartments instead of generative art or instead of prints. They'll want something that was created by a human by hand um, and that'll attract a premium. Um, same thing, I think, for clothing or... Um, purses, shoes, I think things that are handmade are going to start to go up in value and um, attract kind of a luxury premium over things that were made by a machine, whether it's AI or a stitching robot that have been around for, you know, probably 20 years making these garments um, or a sewing machine. Um, but I think people are going to continue to be excited by things that are made by hand. Um, by an actual human, where a human did 100% of the process. Um, so I think that'll be interesting to see.
Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'd love to open it up to anyone who's watching. If you've got some some questions, I, I definitely uh, you know agree, and I think it's um, there will definitely be a, a premium on things that are made by hand. Um, so that's exciting. I might take up some craft activities or learn to paint. Yeah, it's not too late. See if finally I can uh, earn a living by being creative in that way. But um, yes, well, seeing as this is our conference around generative AI and animation, what other industries do you think you know we should focus on for our next conferences? Which are the, the top industries do you, that are being impacted at this time? Um, well, I think obviously the number one industry, according to charts that I see on LinkedIn from Ethan Mollick and Rupert um, is probably coders, right? People okay. are saying coders can be replaced to a large extent. I don't really think that's true, actually, because AIs are really terrible at information security. They have right. like zero concept of compartmentalization. And I suppose you could train one, but no one seems to have made a lot of good progress on that yet. Mm. Um, so kind of that fear versus reality. Um, which I think comes up in a lot of these conversations about AI. It's like, yeah, people are afraid AI can do X, Y, Z because it appears to be magic, but can it actually do everything? Can it do it well? I don't know. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I did uh, a general assembly software engineering course a long time ago, and I was terrible. Kept on coming across bugs and didn't know how to resolve them. Now I would love to do it, come across an error, feed it into chat GBT. It can tell me what's going wrong. It can tell me do X, Y, Z. And um, and I can sort of teach myself as I go along. So, so I think it's a good teacher. Um, it's improved. It's really bad at includes, which are where you bring in a, a library that's pre-written um, in order to do commands. So sometimes it'll tell you here's your code and you try to run it and it won't work. And the reason why is because it skipped like seven important includes for whatever reason. Um, mm -hmm. But I think what you know a lot of organizations are not looking at sufficiently is how secure the code is because supposedly a lot of this chat GPT code um, has a lot of vulnerabilities that could easily be exploited, especially for code that's open on the internet as opposed to like on an internal something or other. Um, so that's definitely something to be wary of. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it a go. Um, I'd love to see any examples of that. I'll definitely do a conference which is more focused on generative AI and coding. I think that would be a fascinating talk. Yeah, absolutely. I think Code Interpreter can do really cool things. Um, one interesting thing people have been using Code Interpreter for is to write web pages where it'll give you like HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, because like when I think of code interpreter, I think of writing like C plus code or Visual Basic, but it also does HTML and Java mm -hmm. and JavaScript. Um, so it can write cool interactive mini web pages. Um, there's Code Llama now, which supposedly is just as good. Okay. Um, I think what's really exciting about Code Llama, uh, which is Meta's open source model, is that there's one called, I want to say, Unstable Llama. Um, so it's um, trained on code written by AIs, and this is one of the first models that was trained on code written by AIs that's actually a good model, because everyone else has been finding uh, AIs trained on generative data, that is, data that came from an AI, not from a human, usually turns into like a garbage model. Um, I guess some sort of theory about like standing between two mirrors and watching the reflection to infinity, right? That's sort of the idea. Um, but if Llama and Meta have uh, gotten a handle on training uh, AIs with data from other AIs, that really opens up a huge door because um, you can there's a finite amount of uh, you know materials generated by humans in all of time, right? But you can basically generate an infinite amount of output from AIs, and then if you could use that to train more AIs, that would be huge. Yeah. Wow. AI is teaching AIs. That's definitely the future. Yeah, it's also featured. Wake up the stuff. wake up the next like morning, that. and they've just uh, <laughs> you know figured out, out how pyramids. Actually, I might I might 
you know, ask Chat GBT, how are the pyramids made? Do do ETs exist? Um, am I conscious? Will I live and go to the heaven or hell or you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I might ask some of those crazy questions, see what it comes up with. Yeah, it's fun to have a chat with it. And particularly I think when um Microsoft first made Bing AI and it like didn't have a lot of restrictions people did a lot of really wild stuff with it and reported mm. some really cool conversations yeah you now know, i think it would be rails. very very dull to have a conversation with it about those things um yeah, so I, need to, in, I need to try maybe wild llama or untamed llama whatever it was called yeah <laughs> absolutely it's the name all right well thank you so much for your time today that was great um i'll keep you posted on the next generative AI conferences that we have coming up, um, specifically around code. And um, where can people reach out to you? Is LinkedIn the best place? Yeah, people can reach me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm Leonard Rodman there. And if you want a shorter URL, um, you can also go to Rodman, R-O-D-M-A-N dot A-I and contact me there. There's a link to my LinkedIn as well. All right, thank you so much. Really appreciate it and have a great day. Thanks, Frankie. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, bye-bye.